Um, this is our team today from all over the country. Um, and I won't go into details apart from the key people that you need to know about is Joe and Callum, who are going to be leading this session. And it's really great to have them here today because um, it, I love working with the therapy team. They tell like I'm a nurse and they come up with take long length to stay from a distant viewpoint and I find them so helpful when I'm working with them in the long length to stay reviews. So I will hand over to Joe and Callum. So thank you. Thank you. Welcome everybody to um, this webinar on um, embracing risk and enabling choice. Um, I'm actually in York, um, just so you know, so I am remote and I hope everything will work okay. Uh, and bear with me, I've never done one of these before. So we will um, move on to the next slide, please. So uh, talking about safe. So this is becoming uh, quite a dangerous word. Um, in the in the NHS for sure, um, we all interpret it, interpret this word very very differently. What I think is safe and what everyone else thinks is safe is going to be very very different. What we have to realise is that we are never going to be able to create a hundred percent safety and not percent risk. So every decision that we all make every single day will have an element of safety or unsafety about it and we'll also have an element of risk in it as well which will be across the spectrum and that's what we just have to be aware of and we have to we will have to make decisions that will feel uncomfortable around these particular subjects but it's about how we deal with that and how we support one another to be able to make those decisions so just before we go on to the next slide we just like to do a poll if that's at all possible. So the question is, uh, which one of these terms have you seen or heard most often during your work? Now you can have more than one answer. So you could have all of them, you could have none of them, you could have one of them. So please um, just have a look at them and, and, and poll accordingly. The top one is back to baseline. Yes, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, so this is very, very popular. It is still being used. Um, I've heard it uh, on several sites that I've been on in the last couple of weeks or so. The, the problem with this particular, the, the harm about this particular um, uh, sentence is that actually other health professionals are using it as well as a parameter for discharge planning. So you will hear social workers, uh, discharge teams, um, nurses, doctors, everyone using this as a parameter for deciding what happens to an, to an individual. Um, and what we have to realize obviously is that we are not going to get people back to how they were before, purely and simply because they have come into hospital with an acute episode and we know that. So it is about, so therapist, people are starting to ask therapists in particular, what should you use instead? What I'm using is good enough to go. So how, you know, so we need to start to change the language which takes us nicely on to our next slide. So uh, along with, so we picked out what we thought were the top four um, within this little uh, group of other things that we have seen. Um, and I've certainly read in notes. So um, it is about language. Language is really, really important. Um, and for those therapists that um, will have a patient that comes back in, and the reason that they came back in is because they failed their discharge or they failed OT or it was unsafe. Uh, what, it, that's quite catastrophic for some people and so therefore they will change how they plan to manage that patient next time round because of the language that's used. So we have to be really, really careful about um, how, we, how we describe what happens to people. And actually if something does go wrong, as we well know, it is a learning opportunity, it is not a blame opportunity. Could I just add something there, Joe? I think when we go around and do the long length of stay reviews around the country and we're talking to therapists about risk and choice, um, a lot of the time you say, well, what can we do from tomorrow? And you, the, the choice of language is something, so you can ban certain terms in the notes, you can, you can positively challenge your colleagues if they say, oh, this, Mrs. Smith has just had a catastrophic stroke, she's not back to baseline, so we can't get her home. Um, so it's that, it's that kind of point where you can make that positive challenge as a clinician to clinician so that you, um, there is something you can do from that moment. Um, 
other things might take a bit of time, the kind of attitudes, behaviours and cultures behind it, but certainly written language and spoken language can be changed immediately. Yeah, no, uh, no, absolutely, Callum, I would agree. Um, yeah, that is something that you can change the next day quite easily. So um, let's, um, let's see what we can do with that uh, going forward. So um, this next slide is really um, a, a, a set of scenarios that will happen probably every single day. They're already happening already. These are, four, these are three scenarios. Where does the greatest risk lie, do we think? Is it the four patients in the emergency department? Is it the seven patients who are on, an out, on outlying wards? Or is it all the ward areas for their patient cohort are full? So that's just really to think about. And I've, I've used this recently and it's quite interesting. So uh, when I used it recently, everyone thought um, each of these scenarios had a risk, which actually they do. And the, again, it goes back to the level of risk will be different for all of these scenarios. Okay, that's quite interesting. <laughs> quite a um, um, fairly evenish spread. I think the poll will also reflect where you work. So if you're an ED clinician, ED may be the biggest focus. If you're a ward-based clinician, then the ward. And if you're managing outliers, it may be that, or it may be all of them. Mm -hmm. So so do we have the next slide? So um, this is really, this slide is in here just to give yeah. some national context around why we're doing what we're doing and why it's really important that we have to embrace risk. Um, so you've got the, um, I'm not going to talk to all of these slides, but um, you've got some statistics there which are, which are quite significant. As we know, in 2018, there was a national ambition around um, decreasing the number of uh, long-stay patients. That has moved, that then moved to 40%. However, we are now looking at bed occupancy as, as a marker for reducing length of stay. But as part of that, the long length of stay process will still be an enabler around that. Um, and also the, the communications is about, it's about bed occupancy or bed equivalent. So looking at new ways of working. So um, I've been part of the SDEC collaborative um, recently. And so looking at same day emergency care, looking at acute frailty pathways, et cetera, to, to move to that 92% occupancy um, as, um, as the new ambition, as it were, nationally. So again, this is um, taken from the national dashboard. So this is the national data. So as you can see that at the top um, with the old, the ECIST codes having been mapped to new national codes, the largest uh, cohort currently nationally is ongoing uh, treatment use of four or less. Um, and that's quite common um, in organizations as well. So when I've uh, shown data for the organizations that I've been uh, presenting to, that is the same top internal reason for them. Um, so the question here is these people aren't, they are ill, but they're not that ill. So do they really need to be in an acute bed? And if they are still acutely unwell, could that be provided elsewhere? And could the community still provide that, that level of care ongoing? Because we know the community actually can manage more than we think it can. Um, and continues to manage quite a high level of risk for those patients that we don't know about. And the next one, news of five or above, again, it would be looking at these patients are sick and some of them may genuinely be sick for genuine reasons. So these, um, these could be people that have had quite complex surgical uh, procedures and have some complications ongoing. But again, it's just finding out why they're sick and why they still need to be in an acute bed. And then the third one um, seems to be quite popular now, which is people are being moved to moved on to a specialist uh, team for a specialty review. And again, it's asking the question and the diagnostics and investigations, do they really need to happen? And in a number of cases, when you ask that question, that light bulb moment does appear and people think, actually, no, we probably could do this as an outpatient um, and then change that decision, which is great doesn't always happen and there will genuinely be people that do need to be seen by specialists. So, but it's still asking the question and making sure that we are adding value. So also looking at national data in terms of the internal delay versus external, this is the split and this is what we would be looking for mostly in most organizations. It's around that sort of 65 to 70 internal you know, 30 to 35 external, where you're starting to get 50-50 or 
um, around that, we would suggest that probably there's something, uh, um, there's a problem with the coding and they're probably not challenging themselves enough around that internal delays. And then the age profile is quite interesting. So looking at this age profile here, um, essentially two thirds of the population nationally are over 70 and above. So they are absolutely that frail, older, vulnerable population um, that um, are still occupying um, beds with a, with a longer length of stay than potentially they should be. Um, and also certainly looking at the age profiles of some of the systems that I've been into recently, that they're, um, one of them I was in actually, their two thirds of their population were 80 and above. So again, they've really got something to do with, with their frail patients. So what I've been saying to um, teams, to therapists, to anybody is, and we know that um, our esteemed colleague Liz Sargent would say the same thing is, the only question we should be asking people is what matters to them, what absolutely matters to them right now, and therefore how can we facilitate that? So this is about asking that question as soon as they arrive in your emergency department, you know, what's important to you right now? If it's to get home and watch Countdown at five o'clock, well then that's fine, that's what we'll do. This is the question we should be asking ourselves. And the second question is, once we've had that conversation, and it may not feel right for us because we think the person is going to be unsafe and at risk. How can we balance the risk and how can we mitigate the risk to in, in order to facilitate what it is that that individual, that person wants at that moment in time? Um, and this is where we start to, we have to support one another around these decisions, um, and, but we have to respect what people are telling us about what they want to do when they come into our care. So I'm sure most of you know all about the last thousand days um, and that this, this is, the whole thing is, this is about time, this is about not wasting people's time, but when they are in our care that we do what we need to do for them, that we add value every single day for them um, and we get them home as quickly as possible. And there's huge amounts of things on Twitter uh, around the last thousand days. And of course, lots of YouTube videos, which we, we also have linked to our YouTube um, channel as well within ESYST. This, um, for most people, as you well know, so this was a study in Scotland of just over 10,000 um, patients. Um, it was on a particular day back in 2010. So essentially a spot audit of um, individuals and what happened to them. Um, so looking at what happened to them eventually, which came up with this um, quite alarming overall percentage of people over 85 dying within one year of hospital admission. So 46%, for me, that feels very high. And we, we still need to, we need to work at this and get this better. So again, it is about making sure that, and this, it's a, a whole host of things. It's not just about working with people once they're, at the, once they're in the ward, it is about what can we do in the emergency department to stop the overcrowding and for people to get to the, the bed that, the, that they need, if they need to come in, but also those that don't need to, how we can turn around, how we can turn them around much quicker within 48 to 72 hours. I think the, Joe as well, I think one of the, the biggest statistics that came out of it was that if you were under 60, you were three times less likely to have died within a year. So there's a huge gap depending on what age you were. So obviously there's different things with comorbidities, et cetera, um, but having a three times more higher chance of dying just because you're 85 um, seems significant. Thanks, Callum. So this is the last slide for me before I hand over to, to Callum to, to go through the rest of the presentation. So the, these, all of these um, points here have been taken from the Embracing Risk Enabling Choice Royal College of Occupational Therapy documents. Um, it's a really, really useful document. We will share it as a slide later if you're not familiar with it. Um, it's a very good document and we would encourage you to share it with all of your healthcare professionals because the principles in it relate to any healthcare professional really. So to physios, to nurses, to social workers, to discharge coordinators, to medics, anybody. So this is about, this is this, um, this grapple between who, who, where does the risk sit? 
does it sit with the clinician or does it sit with the individual? And actually what we would say is it sits with the individual. So we have to give people choice and control and we have to empower individuals to make decisions for themselves. And we have to honor those decisions and we have to move away from thinking that it is our duty of care to say what people need and what they don't need and where they need to be and where they don't need to be at the point at which they no longer require our care. And it isn't about, this is my risk, it's my registration, because that, that, isn't, that isn't the issue. Um, I've spoken to the Royal College of Occupational Therapy along with Liz, and they have said to us that when, when therapists call them, they're not telling them it's about their registration at all. That isn't the message that's coming out. That's not what we must worry about, and that isn't, that shouldn't be a barrier to making the right decisions for individuals at the point at which they want to, they want to go home and be at home. I don't know if there are any questions at this time at all with anything that I've said so far. Please feel free to challenge me if you wish. So I think something just came up in the chat room just about um, our staff supported by their managers, etc. And I think when you and I have been around the country doing this type of presentation and workshop, a lot of the time people will discharge their patients home, but then if they're readmitted back in, then they feel as though they get blamed, so it's a single point of failure. So that band five or that band six, OT or physio or speech therapist, whoever that is, um, feels like the world is kind of falling on top of them. When actually the, the kind of, it's, it should be everyone's kind of, um, kind of joint decision across the system if this person can go home and we'll do everything we can to support them. And if it doesn't work, we will learn from that in future. We won't just say that that will never work again for that person or anyone like that person. Um, so it's really about kind of embracing the system and getting people kind of in that um, closing the loop feedback to say, well, when Mrs. Smith went home, it worked really well and this is fantastic. If you did more of this, it would be great. But actually, Mr. Jones, when he came home, it didn't work for these reasons. So can we try and mitigate that the next time? Um, so it's about trying to learn from these opportunities. Um, and can I um, just ask you a question, both of you, as well, at this point? Um, so as a nurse, um, when I go around, sometimes there is, um, it's difficult sometimes to have courageous conversations. Um, and I think uh, as a nurse, we tend to kind of like pull back a little bit of those difficult conversations. And so I've seen, um, when I go around the hospitals, um, Times where I really felt like, you know, do you know what, those nurses, their leader, their managers got their back and really helped them with those decision making. Um, do you think that's the same for within allied health professionals that, you know, when we can have those bold decisions and those great conversations as a leader to think about our role in supporting people with those? Yeah, I think from my own experience, from my specialty when I was a physio was in stroke. And I would, generally, when I was a band seven on the stroke unit, I'd take my band five and my band six to complex family meetings. I would take them to the patient bedside. I would take them into the gym with me to do joint sessions to have those difficult conversations and so they could hear what I was saying and my reasoning behind it, some of the evidence behind the stroke, some of the, the kind of clinical evidence in terms of what they were presenting like over the days or weeks that I'd seen them. And so they, they were kind of getting themselves prepared and kind of dipping into seeing someone else do it so that they could learn. And I think that's really important and we can all do that across any discipline, medical, uh, nurse, AHPs, um, and that can happen on a daily basis. Andrew? So thanks, Anne. I, I've got a further question really. It's just um, one of the questions, one of the things to me is around knowing what is out there. So I, I'm very conscious there's been some talk on the chat room about ambulances until I came into this role. I really wasn't pre fully appreciative of the impact of my work on a ward to an ambulance crew mm -hmm. and an ambulance service. So one of the things from, to question is whether it's the value, and I think it should be there, of um, particularly therapy teams um, know, and nursing teams knowing what the community provision actually looks like. I think from my experience, we often make assumptions around a community service which are ill-informed but inform our behaviours. I mean, I think from our perspective, we would challenge back a little bit on that because if I'm a band six on a, 
um, care of the elderly ward, I shouldn't have to know all of the different pathways out of the hospital. I think this is for a single point of access is fantastic because if I describe the patient on my referral form and I give that information to the community team go within triage and then sign post appropriately, I don't actually have to think about what's out there in the community. I just have to say this is what Mrs. Smith looks like today in front of me. This is what she was like a few weeks ago before she became ill. And then you decide. So I just describe the person in front of me and you prescribe the care because that's not my speciality as an inpatient physio. And unless I've been in that community rotation and we're seeing more and fewer and fewer people getting out into the community rotation. So the knowledge is just not there. And everyone has a different skill set and obviously the, the case of being in acute versus the case of being in the community and what, what you can do with the patient in their own home is, um, is different. So, okay. so there's a little bit about making sure that we don't have to know everything about everything. What do you think, Joe? Yes, um, I think, uh, I mean, this comes back to, um, there, are t there are two things around this, aren't there? The, the first thing is that the process for people to be able to move through the system um, to transfer care from the acute back into the community needs to be much simpler. And if it was much simpler, then anybody could do it. So everyone should be able to refer. A doctor should be able to refer to the intermediate tier as should an H HCA, but that doesn't happen currently. It does fall to therapists to do those referrals to, um, to a lesser, greater or lesser extent. I'm happy to be challenged on that, but that seems to be the norm in the places that I've gone to, and that shouldn't be the case. Part, and then that leads on to the therapists feel that they need to do an assessment before they, they refer on. So the process needs to be much simpler. And as, um, I mean, it's in one of the slides later. It is about less, less prescribing and more describing of the individual and the, the intermediate tier decides what happens. The other part of what you were saying, Andrew, is also about the confidence um, from the acute to the community. The confidence that the community will pick up in the way that they said they would or they wouldn't. And when they don't, that's when you start to get the failed discharge, unsafe discharge person coming back in and therefore um, undermining that, that clinician that, that made that discharge and therefore uh, taking back the point about, so that will determine how, how they think next time and how they manage their patients next time because they don't want that to happen to them because it's absolutely, um, you know, it's, re it's really um, knocks their confidence in being able to do the right thing. So that would be my take on it um, from that point of view. Yeah, just on that last point, um, Joe, we've we found that this has been a, a real value of the, the board round and feedback, MDT feedback, because that has often been, uh, oh, well, it was just an a allocation of blame. And then you suddenly realise, well, the package of care was in place, but we hadn't written the TTAs or handbook the transport. And so actually the patient left the ward at nine o'clock at night. So, you know, it, yeah. it is actually a system failure yeah. rather than a blame. Um, yeah. But feeding that back into the changes behaviour is absolutely critical because otherwise yeah. it just perpetuates and it's always someone else's fault. Yeah. So that's why we always say it's really, really important where you can to have a small operational group that gets the, the meet weekly if they can to go through the cases that have gone out to talk about what went well what didn't go so well um, mitigate what happened next time start to to create data around what you might need so that you can then inform commissioners around what you need to commission next time around to make it better so absolutely and see it as a learning opportunity not a blame not a blame culture the one thing i want to say before we move on and i know i'm conscious of time is going back to the leadership um uh, comment, uh, Kate, that you were saying. One of the things I have heard from therapists, which is quite sad, is that I can't remember which system it was. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to name names. They didn't. When I asked the question, they didn't feel that they would have the support of the organisation if something went wrong. So the support from the leadership, the clinical leadership. So for AHPs, you know, their operational leads, their clinical leads. It's really, really important that they feel supported by those leads that so that something does go wrong or they, they, they've made a decision that sits uncomfortably with them that they do have the support but they also have the support of the wider organisation as well. I absolutely agree with you Jo, um, I can't emphasise that enough um, and I think that's where when you've got really good strong leadership and long mental stay reviews it really helps 
in that. Um, so that, that, that's almost like that third of safety for the staff, so they feel supported. So thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Kate. Um, so just going on to the first slide that I'll go through. So I'm not going to play this. This is a hyperlink within the slide deck. So when you get the slide deck or the feedback back from today's session, uh, you'll be able to click in. It's a five and a half minute um, video of Doug, who is based down in Salisbury. And there's a lovely video of him at home in his living room uh, with a therapy assistant from uh, Salisbury talking about how Doug wanted to go home. And so there was some support put around him so he could go home and then he ended up having his 90th birthday uh, at home and doing his exercises probably more than he would have done in the hospital. So it's a really lovely uh, engaging video and Liz uh, Sargent is there and um, discussing some of the kind of the issues around it. So I just wanted to ask, has everyone seen these four questions? So we don't have a poll for this, but it's just to kind of highlight that there are four questions that we as ESIS would use. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and I think the first step would actually be, so from my own knowledge about being working on a ward, I'm not sure, I wouldn't be confident that all my colleagues, and myself included, would know the answer to all of these four questions for all the patients in our care. Um, and actually, once we drive some of this knowledge so that you actually know if you're working on a Sunday night or if you're working on a Tuesday afternoon, no matter if you're a nurse, doctor, uh, AHP, you should actually know some of the answers to all of these questions. Um, and then if you take it to the next step, which we would really want to do, the kind of total ideal, would be that each patient or their relative or carer would know the answers to all four questions. Because if I know what's wrong with me or what's been excluded, and I know what's going to happen today, tomorrow, or in future, what I need to do from a functional point of view to get home, and then when I'm going to go home, so my EDD, if I know all that information, if I don't get my x-ray on a Tuesday, then Wednesday or Tuesday night I might ask the doctor or ask the nurse looking after me um, why didn't I get my x-ray today so people will drive their own um, discharge and I think that's what we need I don't know from anyone else's perspective but I don't understand why we don't share that information more regularly um, it's as if we're scared sometimes so that people, will, people we think people are going to nag us um, but, and they should be nagging us because if, if they're in hospital and then unnecessarily hospital and waiting for things we shouldn't, we shouldn't let that happen so just to give you a little bit of uh, information around risk and choice. So I used to work for the hospital to home team and they had developed a series of um, quick guides. So when you click into the presentation again, this uh, thing in blue, which is England Quick Guides to Sport Health, once you click on that, it will give you a whole host of um, quick guides to do with discharge process, looking at supporting patient choice, which is going to be updated soon, um, lots of things to do with health and housing, etc. So there's tons of resources here because I'm sure everyone in their trust has a choice policy, but going around the country, there's not many trusts that we know that either use it at all or use it effectively. Um, and I think in the coming days, weeks, months, um, we're probably going to see quite a lot of change and there'll be a greater appetite for risk and potentially less choice about where people go. So I think when we do ask the question that Joe asked earlier about what matters to me, so when you're asking the patient or person in front of you, I think if I was someone in hospital and I, I always said I wanted to go home and whether I had capacity there and then to make that decision, my family should have already known my wishes or you as an MDT should, have, should potentially be knowing or my GP might know my wishes, I might have a care plan. If I'm wanting to go home, and I might not be able to, in your eyes, go home, there, there definitely should be a discussion with MDT about what can we do, could we possibly try and just try this as a one-off, we'll wrap around some support, we might need some night tank here, we might need some district nurse, we might need um, different bits of equipment, but you really need to try, give the person what they want. Um, if, if a person comes from their own bed, we really want them to go back to their own bed, and if that service does not exist, there and then, we need to be capturing that kind of data. We need to know what the unmet need is. Um, so the RCOT, so the Royal um, College of Occupational Therapy, have got a document, which is, um, again, I've got a hyperlink in there, so you can click onto it, that came out in 2017. And as a physio, I've read it, and there's some fantastic um, bits of information, top tips, etc., for how we can embrace risk and enable the choice. Um, there is something around the therapies who are kind of in charge of discharge, but that should not be the case. There should be any member of the team using clinical criteria for discharge, so from a medical point of view, some physiological um, parameters, and then maybe from OT or physio or nursing colleagues, what functional level people have to get to where the stick in the ground is, this is when you can go home. 
So this is sorry, just a picture of the document so that you can see it. I think Yarkot are quite keen that they're very happy for people to use it, so you don't have to be a member of the Arcot to be able to get this. So if you just go through our hyperlink. Okay. So this is just a just a little bit of an example as to so what have people done to minimize the risk. So if you were saying I'm worried about sending a patient home, the care is not there or the therapy is not there, so then they come back into hospital. So research was done by Aston University uh, last year, which suggested or proved that with a bit of pump prime money, they let some nurses phone a patient within a day of discharge and it showed within a month they'd reduced readmissions in this age group for over 65, so decrease of 41%. So there was money involved, so the system had to provide money to allow this research to take place, but it shows you it's fantastic. And if you think about each admission, if each night in the med acute medical ward costs £350, that's a huge amount of um, cost savings that should be shared across the system, not just he held within the acute trust. Now, I don't know if you've seen the work by John Bolton, so in the useful resources slide that's at the end of this presentation, there is a hyperlink to his work. Um, but this is a fantastic um, visual diagram of what can happen in an ideal situation or kind of the average situation across England for any admissions who are over 65 years old. So John Bolton looked at any, he looked at a thousand admissions. So if you think about how many admissions you have of 65 year olds on a weekly basis, so for instance, if that was 300, then maybe this is three weeks worth of data, for instance. And of those thousand admitted into hospital who are over 65, half of them should go with nothing. They should just be simple discharges that go home or go back to where the residential home, extra care shelter, wherever they came from, they should go back there without any support. Of the remaining 500, 200, so 20%, would only need small kind of bits of either community physiotherapy, community OT, or district nurse. Of the remaining 30%, the 300, those would need some kind of rehab. So whether that's home-based or bed-based, we'd want to kind of split that out. And from John's work and all his research, it looked at, he looked at 250 of those 300 would go home with a re-enablement or enablement type package of care so that within that six-week window, they had the potential to get back to what they were like or somewhere near what they were like um, in terms of independence and their previous function. Of the other 50, they would go into a bed-based um, uh, rehab unit. Um, and when you take the total of those 300 people, whether they went to a home base or bed base, at the end of that period of time, whether it's two, four, six weeks, whichever they had, only 90 would need ongoing domiciliary care support, so a kind of long-term package of care. And from that, only 10, so 1%, would go into long-term care, so residential or nursing home care. And I think if you look at your data, if you looked at three weeks' worth of data, if you looked at however much, uh, a thousand admissions of 65 and over, I can, I can assure you most systems we go into are roughly, I don't know, 10 to 15% minimum who go into long-term care. So I think that's a huge number. And we know that from the evidence, if you've been admitted into residential or nursing home care, if you're, if you're admitted, 85% of those admitted are still there one year later. So it's not just a quick, let's go in and we'll get you a bit better and then you get home again. Most people don't get back out of long-term care. So I think just in terms of what people can do in their trust and across the uh, acute and community, what people need to do for planning for discharge, what we found what works the best is, um, I know my trust, we, have, we, we had control of our community team and we had rotations out into the communities and we also had a kind of health and social care role, so it was fantastic, but it's about the intermediate care team saying just saying yes, we will support this. It is about going through a single point of access, so it's about a describe, not prescribe model. Um, so from some work done by Newton Europe in 2017 across 14 trusts across England, they looked at over 14,000 case notes and they showed that between 25 and 50% of care is over prescribed either by the nursing, care, nurse, nursing staff or by therapists. Um, I think from my own physio background, when we start doing goal setting, it's not about getting Mr. or Mrs. Smith back to driving and back to walking up and down the stairs and back to being independent, going for the shops. It's about what is the goal they need to stick in the ground that says, potentially, I can transfer with one, I've got continent issues dealt with, and I've got some nighttime safety issues dealt with. And once you've wrapped around those three things, that's when the patient can go home. So I think when you say, oh, the patient must be able to run up and down the stairs and do cartwheels, I think that's just not appropriate. Um, so when people do goals, it needs to be an MDT type goal um, setting venue.
I'm just going to say at this point, I was, one of my memories that always stands out from when I first started in Shrake was um, having the discussion and uh, the team had this big plan about what the patient should do, but actually when you spoke to the patient, the most important thing to the patient was she was able to feed her cat independently. Yeah. And it's like we, we all see things through different lenses and we must involve what's important to the patients in that. So, um, thank you. Andrew, anything from the chat room? So I'm um, um, chatting away. No, I think it's been, it's been the four questions have come back up again. Lots of um, some good ideas around that. Um, talking about patient stories, which we've talked about in the previous webinar series. Um, but other than that, I think everyone's been listening attentively. Oh, to Joseph. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when we are collecting all this information, um, we should be basing our goals on what the, what the needs are of the person, but also what the service can deliver. And again, if, it isn't, if the service isn't there in your, um, your local area, we need to know what that unmet need is, because if you don't have Raven that can be responsive within two hours or two days, um, we need to start thinking about that, because that's what the long-term plan has been set out to do. Um, and I think, yeah, just agreeing, just communicating very well with the person in front of you, the patient, the family and relatives, so that they know what the plan is, because if it comes as a shock the day before discharge and they don't know or the day of discharge, oh, by the way, your mum's coming home, that, that never really works out very well. So this is just a quote uh, from Chris Tuckett, who's at Health Physio on his Twitter handle. So good people make good decisions, brave people make brave decisions, healthcare professionals have to make both. And I, I really like that because we do have to be brave and we do have to, I remember in my stroke, um, role, having to have discussions with patients and their family next of kin about the potential for how independent would they be? Would they be independent in a tilt and space wheelchair? Would they end up in a manual um, uh, supported wheelchair? Or would they be walking? Would they be able to transfer? Would they get back to driving, back to their job? So we did have to have really difficult conversations. Um, and I think that we don't take, we take that for granted quite a lot. And there's, there's nothing in our university degrees that, that I was training that, that taught me how to do that. It was just through practice. And then finally, this is just a small funny slide, just so we can see that we don't want to get people to the point where in order to minimize risk, they're just going to do nothing. Mm. They're going to be like either lying in a bed in a hospital with the bed rails up, being told that the relatives can't walk them to the toilet, the relatives can't help the transfer, the nursing staff are not allowed to do it. You have to wait on the physio or the occupational therapist. I think we need to get well away from, from that. We seem to collect lots of data around infection and falls, but we don't do any positive indicators of mobility. So we don't do how many minutes someone sat out or stood up or exercised for. We don't do how many steps someone goes. So I've got a Fitbit, and they are becoming more cheap, um, more and more cheap. So I think there is something around trying to look at positive indicators for, for mobility, because I think the biggest thing right now for the elderly population, for those 70 plus and 21 days plus, length of stay is that they're, they're deconditioning and that we're harming them. So here are the useful resources. So once you get the slide deck, you'll be able to click into any of these hyperlinks to go directly to the papers. So help yourself with that. If there's any other papers or useful resources that you've got that you'd like to share, then you can please put it onto the chat box uh, with your email address, uh, send it to us. So these are our contact details. So that's our hashtag. Oh, sorry, our Twitter handles and their email addresses, so I'm really down with technology. So, um, Andrew, have you got anything from the chat room that you want to add? No, um, the couple, people are now adding uh, their email addresses, which is really? great. Okay. And if you are already on the NHS Futures Collaborative platform, and I know recognising names are on, on the webinar today, that's great. If you're not, please let us know, and we, you'll get an invite, and there's some ongoing discussions we post there regularly. Um, and can continue the conversations. Uh, I think the, um, there's quite a lot of discussion around um, the importance of potentially over-prescribing care, mm -hmm. the implications for patients if they are discharged not to their own home uh, for their long-term care needs and things and the impact that has on them. Um, I, I really like that Joe posted about um, involving volunteers and health watch to audit the four questions. I 
personally found the four questions really, really engaging for staff. It really makes all the teams stop and think, myself included. Yeah. I think I'm a pretty good communicator. It turns out I'm not. Um, and I, I think we've, we've covered it on many of the webinars actually now. Um, so using volunteers and health watch to promote that, I think, is, is, is a great idea. And I think just from a therapy background, we might see our patients for half an hour, 45 minutes, one hour a day. But that still leaves 23 and a half hours or 23 hours where we're not doing the therapy, the job that we're paid to do. So you do need to get the healthcare assistants and the nursing staff and the medical staff. You do need to get the patients themselves motivated to do their own exercises. You do need the relatives to come in and support us because we can't do everything. Um, so there's a huge um, opportunity here to do something different um, because there's not enough staff in the hospital to, to see everyone and do everything all day. But I think it's really important. I mean, I'm a consultant, so I see the patient for five to ten minutes for, you know, for follow-up, you know, consultation on the ward. Um, and that leaves an awful long time for everyone else with the patient. And if, if the messages we're not aligned in our messaging with the patient, it's no wonder they can't, can't answer any of the four questions. Yeah, exactly. We'd like to take us nicely to the end of the webinar. Thank you all so much for joining today. Thank it's you. been a great discussion and um, have a fantastic um, afternoon.